Shall we move on now to our second speaker session with Professor Sir Peter Knight. He's a senior research investigator at Imperial College London, <coughs> a senior fellow in residence at Chichley Hall, part of the Royal Society, and a past president of the Institute of Physics. And he's going to talk about Maxwell, field theory, and the road to relativity and quantum theory. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, you will. Thank you. Um, I'm going to cover some of the ground also that Peter did, but with a, with a slightly different emphasis, of course. Um, this year is the International Year of Light. It's the United <laughs> Nations uh, activity to celebrate a, a whole raft of things involving how light transforms our understanding of the world. And of course, part of our celebrations involved the anniversary of Maxwell. So I, I'm going to go right back to the start and, and, and uh, of Newton. Um, and, and our understanding of light, and, uh, and I'd like to say that, in fact, I think Newton hedged his bets on the nature of light. He, uh, he had this um, almost unintelligible phrase, fits of easy reflection, which, which combined a, a kind of corpuscular view and a wave view of light. Um, an awful lot of, of what we understand of, 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 of light stems from a combination of very early work um, by Al Haytham and others in it within the Arab world, um, Newton very much formulated all of these things. Um, but but the Newtonians came very much down in in, in terms of a corpuscular view. <coughs> and uh, yep, Newton did these rheumatic experiments where he he, he broke up the components uh, of of a uh, a light field, a, a white light field, with a prism. He dispersed them. He then combined them again with another prism, and he got back white light. Um, and there's this lovely phrase, in these three experiments, it's, fa it's father very remarkable that the color of homogeneal light, and it means white light, was never changed by the refraction. So if you look at Newtonian views of life, um, it, it was kind of odd action at a distance. Um, if you imagine uh, two, two particles, A and B, uh, separated by distance R, they might be electric charges, for example. Force between them goes Z squared over R squared. Um, and so basically, it really much is an action at a distance. The force on A depends on where B is, but how do you know where, where B is? Um, and it's really this idea of fields. We've heard already that Faraday and Maxwell started to introduce these. Um, Faraday, very much uh, a practical sort of person. Um, Maxwell, very much the sort of person that could put it onto a firm quantitative mathematical definition. So Maxwell introduced the idea of a field, um, and, and the, the idea is that field permeates space, and the force on A is towards the direction in which the number changes fastest. Th these are the things that, that generate what we understand in, in terms of Maxwellian electrodynamics. Um, there's still no tangible connection between A and B. That came later on with Feynman and others uh, using the Dirac idea of quanta of photons. And I'm going I'm to mention a little bit about that when we come through. So let, let, let's, let's see how Maxwell started. Maxwell started in a really ingenious way. He, he built models first. Those models then gave him uh, the idea of how these various interactions fitted together. Uh, and he started with the idea of these vortices that rotated. He had lots and lots of subsidiary cogs and wheels. And to make it all consistent, um, he had to do something which was kind of dramatically different from what he'd seen before. So in, in 1862, the, the paper with all these vortices in, he does a great deal of work, and then he finds that in order to make all these cogwheels all work, he had to add a thing called a displacement current. Um, so in addition to Ampere's law, and, and, and the, 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 the additional part uh, has the rate of change, the, the time derivative of the electric field, the displacement current. As soon as you put that displacement current in, things change. So if that was his, 1960, uh, his 1862 paper with lots of cogs, wheels, vortices. The remarkable thing is later, he just removed all the scaffolding and just produced a mathematical model that, 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 re, that didn't rely on any of that scaffolding altogether. So there's the paper uh, that we're actually celebrating. Um, and there are a number of things that I wanted to flag up in terms of, of the time scale for all of this. Um, so this is the first bogus time scale. 
Okay, and I'll come back to others. Okay, published 1st of January. It was not. Every single electronically available issue from 1865 has that same DOA. Okay? Right. So that's, that's the paper we're talking about. So let's have a look at it. It was received by the Royal Society on the 27th of October, 1864. It was handwritten with many crossings out. The writing deteriorates very dramatically as you come towards the end. Um, it was clearly written over some time. It was read before the Society, and that probably means just the abstract, on the 8th of December. It was sent to William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, later, to referee on the 24th of December. Um, then a referee letter came to back to the Royal Society from Kelvin, saying, can he have more time? Um, it went to Stokes, the president of the Royal Society. Stokes made a decision to print. It was sent to the printer. Well, firstly, it was agreed on the 15th of June um, that, that it was a decision to print. It went to the printers on the 16th of June. The volume appeared, as far as we can work out, in November. OK? And there's that spurious date. So just to confirm what I said about the handwriting, that, that's Maxwell's paper, handwritten. Terrible handwriting, as you can see. OK? Right, you can't read any of that, except I want to point out another bogus thing here. Um, it says 1863, and then someone's crossed it out and put four there. Okay? All right, so that's the manuscript that was submitted. It's a very long manuscript. This is Kelvin's referee report. <laughs> I think I violated confidentiality by showing you this, but never mind. Um, and this came from William Thompson's club in Glasgow. It's, uh, it, this, if you think the other writing was so awful, look at this one. My dear Stokes, I am sorry to have kept Maxwell's paper so long. That's the sort of phrase that every editor dreads. <laughs> I read it nearly through <laughs> with, with great interest. And, and what he goes on to say is he thinks there's things that might be worthwhile here. Okay, so it got published. But you see the spirits, oh, I wanted to show something else on that. Let's, let's have a look. It's kind of fun to know. It was the 137th referee report. If you like numerology. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Maxwell's equations. Um, and here's a phrase from, from the Maxwell paper. The agreement of the results seem to show that light and magnetism were affectations. That's a lovely word of the same substance, and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. And there's the, the speed of light. OK, and then if we look at the heavy side rewrite of these things, uh, there it is with the speed of light, and this idea of an electromagnetic wave where Bs and Es couple together to propagate um, in, a, in a way that these equations suggest. And there's the Maxwell additional displacement term at the end. I'll come back to units in a mo uh, towards the end, and especially Maxwell's relationship with the SI unit system, uh, if, if I have time. OK, so there's the Maxwell's equations, either in integral form or in differential form. OK, so electromagnetic theory was, was absolutely the first success, as we've heard from, from Professor Higgs. The, um, it was the first of the, of the, uh, of the, the attempts at the uh, grand unification. It brings together electricity, magnetism, and light. Um, and it very much looks as if we were really understanding a great deal of the classical world at that point. Um, I'll explain who this, this fellow is in a minute. But Faraday, Maxwell, Hertz. Okay, so Hertz demonstrated electromagnetic waves. Um, something I, I quite like to remind people about is the first really decent long distance communication by electromagnetic waves was actually done by Rutherford. It was actually Rutherford's project when he first arrived in Cambridge from New Zealand, and he set up a, a transmitter and receiver, center of Cambridge in the Gog Magog Hills, and then he decided to move on from that, because obviously there's no, there's no further application of this, because waves would diffract out into space. Nobody knew about the ionosphere. Okay? Marconi didn't know anything, but he thought, let's give it a go, and it works. So, and, and in fact, 
It's these people that the general public will know about. Not Maxwell. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, and if you think about it, light absolutely powers our world today. The, the way that we communicate, do business, entertain ourselves is because electromagnetic waves whiz around the world down optical fibers, um, and these, these are the fiber links um, that, that connect the world together. They, they follow pretty much the old roots of the cable system of Kelvins. And uh, if you look at the take-up of these things, broadband is possible because of light. Okay, so relativity, um, and Peter mentioned this earlier, the, the, the remarkable feature of, of the Maxwellian theory is that it, it is a relativistic theory. So if you try to reconcile in a believable way classical mechanics and electromagnetism, um, it, it's really very difficult. But, but classical electromagnetism is compatible with, with special relativity. And so you've got this universal constant, the speed of light, and that, that, that absolutely uh, violates Galilean invariance. And, and one way to, to deal with it is to try to suppose there exists a luminiferous ether. The, the ether then, um, it's almost like the, uh, the, 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 the media through which this light <coughs> propagates. But Michelson, Morley, and others didn't see any, anything that, 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 that related to the presence of an ether. And, and then, it, of course, it was then through the work of Lorentz, of Fitzgerald, and Poincaré, then Einstein solved the whole thing with special relativity and demonstrated you did not need to change the Maxwellian theory. Maxwellian theory is already relativistic invariant. Uh, and uh, as Professor Longer pointed out, that Maxwell paper contains the Lorentz force as well. Right, so there's the principle of relativity, um, that, that, that you've got this invariant light speed. Light in a vacuum propagates with a speed. It's a fixed constant. Um, and uh, that really is the transformative thing, which Maxwellian theory was the precursor. OK, so forces and unification. Um, by bringing together electricity and magnetism together, we saw the first of these. And Peter has actually mentioned um, all of these things that come together. The, if you take uh, Newton, and, and uh, his study of celestial mechanics, the idea of, uh, uh, of universal gravitation, that's our, our first of our fundamental forces. That's just the magnetism comes together through electromagnetism. That was Clark Maxwell. Um, we just heard from Professor Higgs about the, uh, the, the, the marriage of electromagnetism with the weak force. And then we could actually go to, uh, through the same thing again with the strong force and chromodynamics. So if you've got these various branches, you start over on the right-hand side with a whole raft of what's apparently disparate theories. <coughs> Magnetism, electricity, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, and gravity. And you start to pull these things together. There's Maxwell with, with the first unification, and it can be quantized. This is the Fermi contact force that Professor Higgs mentioned. And that leads eventually to the weak theory, and they get married together with the electroweak. There's the nuclear force, which generates quantum chromodynamics, and then could be married up with a supersymmetric theory. And of course, we're finding that there's increasing bounds on the size of the supersymmetric. People during the question time mentioned the CERN experiments that are putting bounds on it, but the laboratory experiments that put bounds on supersymmetric particles. Experiments done at Imperial College, and uh, Harvard already ruling out a lot of the simpler supersymmetry theories. So, let's look at how these things get quantized. How, how does Maxwell's theory survive field quantization? So we're back to Einstein again, and that's the standard canonical portrait of Einstein. And it's a travesty, because it suggests to the general public that this man with this mad white hair everywhere that's what he looked like when he did these, can, these, these transformational things. I think we do a disservice by keeping with this image. OK? If you look up there, you see a formidable force in front of you. Um, and he was very young when he did all of this. Right, so one of my other heroes, Paul Dirac, showed how you would take Maxwellian theory and quantize it. OK, if I take the electric energy density and the magnetic energy Put it all together to form the total energy, a Hamiltonian. 
And, and imagine I put this thing in a box, and I've got boundary conditions, and so that, that settles what the modes are going to be like. You've got a cosine and a sine. And I write my magnetic field in terms of something called P and some junk. Electric field in terms of Q and some junk. Then that turns into a harmonic oscillator. Okay? So every single frequency of a free field looks like a harmonic oscillator. And we know how to quantize harmonic oscillators. You take these Qs and Ps and you put hats on them. And you put hats on them and they obey a commutation relation. And that's all QED is really going to be. Okay, so what Dirac shows is you decompose the field into modes. Each mode is a harmonic oscillator. There's the ground state, the first excited, the second. In other words, that's no quanta, one quanta, two quanta. And you climb up and down this ladder with a creation operator and an annihilation operator. So all I need to do with field quantization is I take a Maxwellian field. I write down whatever the harmonic dependence of the field is. I've got a thing over there, which will be the unit pol the polarization. And a pl if it's a plane wave, I've got easy IKRs. And I remember that these things don't commute. Right. So it's often asked of me, as a quantum optics professor, how come you've got these modes, which are occupation uh, 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 numbers in a, in a box, but we like to think of photons as things that travel. So all you need to do is to make up a wave packet. So what I've done in this little movie is to make a wave packet. It's a Gaussian wave packet. It's in two dimensions. It's easier. It's got 256 by 256 modes. I started off with this Gaussian and just let it evolve. So it's a fuzzy sort of blob of probability distribution. And that's got one quanta in it. And when you've done that, you can do some fairly interesting things in terms of interference. So interference with these electromagnetic waves, very much, it depends whether you're English or you're French, as to whether it's Thomas Young or Auguste Fresnel did a lot of these things. Well, of course, they both did. Okay, so there's Thomas Young. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> it's a very good book, though. Um, and Jeffrey Taylor, Sir, Sir Jeffrey Taylor, was a, a, t a student of J.J. Thompson's. And J.J. Thompson, being a very good supervisor, said, I've heard about these Einstein quanta. What happens if you only put one quanta in the box at one time? What happens to interference? So Taylor did that experiment. He did it in his nursery at home at school. Uh, at nursery at home. He set up the thing. His longest exposure time was 2,000 hours. Told you something about the stability of the floor of his nursery and saw so no diminution in Young's fringes. Okay? Right. Gave up quantum physics, became the world's most distinguished fluid mechanics theorist. Uh, and quantum optics is really what happens if you, if you extend that idea. So there's Taylor. So having done that funny wave packet thing, I want to show you how you can understand interference. Um, this is one of the more complicated and pointless calculations I ever did on a supercomputer. Um, I took that Gaussian wave packet, representing that single photon wave packet, and the blue line that some of you can see is a string of, of atoms. And I took the quantum electrodynamic description of the field modes and the atoms, and I exactly solved it numerically. So it's a fully QED calculation. And this string of atoms has a little hole over here. And of course, light diffracts through. So light comes in, something gets reflected, something gets transmitted. So that's Young's two slit from ab initio calculations from QED. As I said, it's pointless because it's, it does exactly what Thomas Young said it would do. We can investigate correlations in this, which Thomas Young couldn't. Well, if you've done that for one slit, why not do it for two? Okay, so all of this works because the Helmholtz equation, the, weight, the Maxwell wave equation, the, the geometrical part is exactly the same whether quantities are quantized or not. The geometry is, is dictated by the Helmholtz equation. OK, now, the SI unit system, which is my final thing, I noted the unit system and the plaque that, was the, 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 that you've put in. Maxwell has a, a, a link to the SI unit system. Um, we used to have a thing called a standard yard. It was, it, it, was in, uh, it was ensconced in law from an act in 1824. It was the distance between a pair of lines 
etched in gold plugs inserted in a bronze bar, and it was put in the House of Commons in the custody of the clerk of the House of Commons for safety. Okay, it was designed to, to, uh, as a standard yard, okay, measured at 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that was, that was an implementation of something the Royal Society has suggested based on an early Elizabethan standard yard. Okay, so that standard yard existed. It lasted for nine years and 198 days. Remember, 62 degrees? And the House of Commons burnt down. So the standard yard was completely lost. That, that's Turner's wonderful painting of the House of Commons burning down. And by the time they looked into the debris, they could find no evidence of the survival of the standard yard. The Royal Society had a copy, which was quite fortunate. But what it meant was that we had a vulnerability, that we, 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 we had a unit system based on artifacts that are perishable. And what Clark Maxwell suggested was the following. If we wish to obtain standards of length, time, and mass, which should be absolutely permanent, we must seek them not in the dimensions or the motion or the mass of our planet, but in the wavelength, the period of vibration, and the absolute mass of these imperishable, unalterable, and perfectly similar, use the word molecules, we would use atoms. That's the whole philosophy of the SI unit system. And it derives from the suggestion from Clark Maxwell that we needed to have something imperishable that would survive such a fire. Okay, my closing remark, the International Year of Light, events have been going on all year around the world to celebrate how light, the union of electricity and magnetism, transforms our world. And I think that one of the things we wanted to make sure that we celebrated in appropriate form was the enormous contributions that Maxwell made to our understanding. Thank you for listening. So, time for a few questions. Once again, raise your hand if you're interested in asking a question. Um, I'm sure you know this story, but it's interesting there is this wonderful relationship between Maxwell and Michelson and the, the experiments for the speed of light. That, in fact, in the posthumous paper of 1880 is a correspondence to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, Naval Observatory in order to find out how accurately you could measure the one-way speed of, speed of light. Uh, Maxwell in his paper says it's impossible to carry out this experiment because we can't measure, the, measure precisely enough the, the travel times. Michelson picked it up and said, yes, we can, yes. because we can do interferometry. And so uh, Maxwell actually led to Michelson doing the first experiment, which is not very good, and he did his sums wrong, and then the michelson mori experiment got it right. Wonderful, I'm, wonderful connection. I have nothing to add to that other than to recommend to the audience that if they want to know more details of the historical uh, part of how Maxwell's paper was received, Malcolm has written a beautiful paper in Philosophical Transactions this mm -hmm. year as part of the 350th anniversary of Phil, uh, of Phil Trans. And, and I'm sure you'll find a lot more insights like that in, in Malcolm's paper. I want to make a remark about G.I. Taylor leaving quantum mechanics to become a leading fluid dynamicist. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to note that I think Heisenberg, his initial PhD topic was on turbulence, mm -hmm. still open problem of fluid mechanics, which he left, and then of course entered the world of quantum mechanics to great effect. I'm not sure there's a conservation law there, but there might be. <laughs> and right at the back. Thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, I've got a very quick question on how do you think Maxwell developed his uh, mathematical intuition uh, as compared to, for example, Faraday had the experimental intuition? And um, was yeah. Thank you. I'm. I've looked very carefully at Faraday's papers uh, in this area. Faraday was had, had a kind of mystical view of the world, almost as an intuitive. Things will arrive almost like in a dreamlike state to Faraday. You know, I'm a trustee of the Royal Institution. You go and play with the notebooks and go and look in the laboratory. Um, but one thing that's clear is that he, 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 he seemed to have an allergy to 
to mathematics, based in part, I, I think, because of his earlier training and so on, the way that he came in through, uh, through a very different route. Maxwell, of course, had gone through a really rigorous training in mathematics, both here in Edinburgh and then in Cambridge, and, and, and w was perfectly able to quantify these things. But it was still interesting that he found it necessary to build a kind of mechanical model first with all, these, all of these vortices. But then he had the confidence to set them on one side and say it doesn't matter anymore. We, we, we could strip away, if you like, the machinery uh, and just replace it by the variables and the fields. But it is true that he did credit Faraday with the field idea. Um, and, and of course, Faraday had this idea of the magnetic field. He could visualize it, you know, the famous iron filings on a bit of paper. He liked to visualize things. Um, I'm not saying Maxwell didn't like to visualize, but he had a tremendous confidence in his ability to, to, to provide a mathematical explanation. Um, I think that if you look at all of the correspondence later, it's quite clear that Faraday didn't quite approve at one point of the mathematical extensions of some of the ideas that he'd come up with. He, he felt somehow that mathematics had diminished it. He came around in the end, of course, but there was this earlier, earlier phase where he looked like he was disapproving. It's a very interesting dialogue between the two. And of course, the person that ideas were bouncing to and fro from uh, was actually between Maxwell and William Thompson. William Thompson had actually seen all of these earlier developments all, all the time. Um, and I think very much was the kind of mentor there. Thank you very much. We can continue discussion over coffee and tea, which will be upstairs in the welcome room. And there's also the exhibit there, Maxwell to Higgs, which you might like to look at. Could you be back for five past 11, please, to hear Sir Michael Attire? Very good.